All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Sweat Equity. It's been three weeks. Yeah. You were living a lavish lifestyle. Um, Don't expose me like that. <laughs> I I was in Fort Worth for a little bit. Got to train then with some dope people. It's been a it's been a cool two weeks. It's been a cool two weeks. Fucking Cade was struggling. Yeah. Cade was struggling. Yeah, shout Our, out to Cade. Yeah. No, he's real grit. Um, but you want to hear one of the, the craziest vanity metrics of all time. Um, but it's working because it's getting everybody to post video on LinkedIn. So I've posted two or three videos on LinkedIn this week. Yeah. 627,000 post impressions. Wow. That's pretty insane. And none of them have gone like viral, viral. Are they getting a ton of likes? No. So 80 likes, 300,000 impressions. <laughs> wow. That's perfect. <laughs> and this sweat equity clip. It's like, yeah. it's, it's uh, so for example, this, we just posted this one. Okay. This one doesn't have that many. Let me go to uh, another one. Okay. The one that has 85 likes, 319,419 impressions. Uh, like, wow. That is so booty. I mean, there's many people in our circles that were claiming that LinkedIn video was the next big thing. And I kind of believed him for no. a second. I'm just like so categorically out on LinkedIn, like as a platform, I think it's not a creative platform. And no matter how much they continue to try and do that, like, I just don't think it'll work. I don't think I'll ever consume video content on LinkedIn, but I'll forever just repost, repost our stuff. Yeah. No, right? I mean, it, it makes sense. You'd be dumb not to, but... Um, like if you, if I could get like me, I'm I'm dumb that I don't post clips on there. I could have dumb that you don't post clips in general. Yeah, right. But if I could get five, ten million impressions every single month on Sweat Equity clips, and it has a Sweat Equity banner, like why not? <laughs> you don't, know what I'm saying? Don't, don't let the sponsor you're about to pitch this to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why not? But okay, so I wanted to save this for the pod before we uh, dove into the next area into into the the good parts. Um, you and I have both been driving technically illegally for a year or two i don't know why you looped me into this because I'm, it's true before you, we started you, you said you're literally narking right out this me right lease. now <laughs> you're think... narking me right now what if there's like <laughs> some austin pd <laughs> no, that, dude watching the pod they cannot take content from the pod and do anything with it i i don't know i just saw a murder mystery dog <laughs> Bro, on netflix and every they, rapper they convicted him every for rap, worse. so many rappers would be behind bars i think okay there is there's like one that i think it's actually <laughs> Anyways, there's precedent um, on all fronts for that not to be the vibe, but so, sure. well, let me, let me give you the context. So before we went to Fort Worth for the CrossFit games, I was like, okay, I got to get my license plate before I'm in a different city. I'm driving across, you know, three, four hours. So we go over to, it's like the tax collection office. Like that's where you get your license plate. Okay. So I get there Friday morning, 8 AM. I'm like one of the first five people. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Vanessa is that she's because she was with me because we were running errands before we left. She's like, yeah, babe, I think it's like seven dollars like it because you have to get your inspection, all this. She's like, I think it's like seven dollars. It'll probably be a late fee. I was like, OK, I'm probably spending two, three, four, maybe five hundred bucks, like whatever. Bro, I so sh she starts checking me out like the the lady um, that's doing all my stuff and the new dad aura. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She starts. Uh, Sorry, Vanessa. Yeah. Here, she, <laughs> She starts uh, checking me out and, and she's like, okay, so it's going to be an extra $250 late fee because you should have done this a long time ago and credit, bro. Like it's me right here. And you know, it's a little office. And so anything that somebody says, or I say, everybody hears. Right. Right. And so the, the, at this point, like the room's pretty packed and she goes, okay, so your grand total is 4,600 and something dollars. And I go the first, my first, I go, the fuck for what? Yeah. Because I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So when you buy a Tesla, you don't pay the tax on it. Right. So when you go to, to like, again, when I bought my Model Y, I had to now pay the taxes that I've never paid on the car. Wow. And so they were collecting the sales tax there. And I had no clue. So like, even when you get the loan for the car, <laughs> bro, when I tell you, <laughs> it's like, crazy. absolutely, I was, I was livid. I told the lady, I said, I just want to walk out. Like, I don't need a plate. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. It's going to be cheaper to Should bail me out of jail. At that point, like, can they huh? send the feds after you right after you? I don't leave? know. That's why I, I would have faded it. I would have got out of there. I, think. I was thinking about it. I was like, why? I was like, I don't Bad need this. Bad precedent then. to set for Zara, though. She sees her dad's a convict, criminal. It's cheaper to bail. Yeah. It's cheaper to bail me out, though. Factual. I mean, 
I have yeah. a license plate on my car though now. That's that's great. Well, congratulations. <laughs> um, I'm happy. So for you. Uh, yeah, it, the license plate that whole thing would have been a few hundred dollars, but it's crazy. So like any time you buy a Tesla from Tesla, yeah, you have to pay. You have to buy the sales or you have to pay the sales tax later when, the, but they don't tell you that. That's which crazy. is crazy. That yeah. They now changed it though. Oh, they showed it. They changed it in, the, it in the last, like la last few months. Found it on Reddit. Where like now, if you buy a Tesla, it's included in the car loan. Because like I, you technically unbelievable to not include that in the car loan. Like to amateurize that over six years. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm 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 paying a thousand dollars a month for my car. Yeah, and that's crazy. I would think that sales tax is included into that car loan. Yeah. So to hit me with that bill and like I was getting a new tire changed on the car too. That's another five hundred. It was. It was the worst like start to, hey, we're taking a nice family trip to Fort Worth. Absolutely just <laughs> gutted. Like Damn. just terrible feeling. I mean, hey, good thing you're a, a niche micro internet celebrity now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, you got them funds coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, all right. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, back to the shit that people care about. I like, let's <laughs> talk some marketing stuff. So when I talk to a, a brand, like the first thing that they complain about is ad efficiency. I think everyone in the game can relate everyone. to this problem. Yeah. And what's the reason your ads aren't converting? It's because you're not being convincing enough. So the natural next question is how do you make your ads more convincing? The first thing that I like to recommend is inject some modern social proof. So in the past, people would think, okay, this is saying we have thousands of happy customers. That's the boomer way of doing it is saying we have X amount of reviews. At this point, I think Gen Z and like a lot of folks they don't even look at reviews as real numbers. They're probably going straight to Reddit and seeing what the streets are actually saying about your product. So a lot of those previous forms of social proof, which are saying that this is beloved by X amount of people, those are just kind of nice to have. They're not as essential as they used to be. But what I do think really moves the needle is, is this. When you address the objections you know are coming in your script, so there was a video that went pretty viral about these Lenovo headphones on TikTok. And I thought the guy did an excellent job of addressing objections that you would have about cheap headphones that you found on TikTok shop in his video. It, was, it makes it feel like a two-sided conversation. You want, you want to like understand how people are watching videos. They're, this is a parasocial relationship, parasocial meaning. They're watching you talk to them. And so this guy, he knows what the rebuttal is gonna be when he's talking about cheap headphones. Instead of saying they're waterproof, he says, sometimes I wear them in the shower. Instead of saying these have long battery life, he says, I haven't charged them since I got them. All of a sudden, these real life scenarios are framing the benefits of the product, which are directly tied to the questions and objections that someone might have before they buy 100%. it. So the goal is to make the customer feel like you know exactly what they're going to say in response to your ad. And then say that with your script and that'll make your ads more convincing. I agree big time on the on the social proof part. And what I'll mention is, uh, you know, Bloom Nutrition. Yeah. So I was going through their ad li library because I'm making like a good ads versus bad ads. Uh, ironically, I, I filmed it this um, earlier this week and they had just absolutely terrible social proof on their ads. Like they had a bunch of static ads. And it showed like the the product, right? So they it had the container open. And it showed like somebody scooping it or like a scoop. And it just goes uh, over a hundred million scoops sold. Yeah. Cool. Right. What do you want me to do with that information? Versus, you know, they're they're. Are you talking about the greens? Because now they're doing energy drinks. Yeah, yeah I'm um, talking about the greens. It's, it versus like it could have been, you know, over a million solved gut bloating for over a million people yeah yeah, you know yeah what i'm saying yeah. it's like like <laughs> everybody else. 100 million happy poops yeah yeah exactly <laughs> they're I mean, versus okay so somebody that does this actually really well and again i think their product tastes disgusting but athletic greens yeah they'll spin up testimonial uh static image testimonies that look beautiful but then the testimonials are uh basically what you're saying like something that the the individual is thinking about or is the objection and you say it for them and so Literally, one of the ads is like, I've had X amount of amazing poops. Yeah. Uh, couldn't be happier. Right. Yeah. And then they they tailor the testimonial to the pain point or the objection. And yeah. then they scale this across. They basically take one static image and then they have 10 variations of it with 10 different pain points. Yeah. Versus Bloom Nutrition is like, I, I, I mean, if you look at some of their ads, it's like a Canva template with a product and that's it. For sure. I think they're, they're, they're a brand that unlimited upside 
because to your point, maybe the, you know, creative strategy behind a lot of their pay debts hasn't been modernized quite yet. I bet they're doing a lot of cleanup with a lot of their static image ads because they have such a robust influencer program. Um, the founders actually live here in Austin. Yeah. They, uh, I, I met them at the C4 headquarters. They're great. It, what's his name? Uh, I think Andrew? the CEO is Greg and then it's his wife, uh, Mari, I think. She, okay, she's I'm, a she's got a really large Instagram following, I'm um, thinking of, but they're interconnected with like JT and Sammy and all that, right? Right, and um, great business. They're they're blowing up. They just launched an energy drink. But to your point, like, what's that next level up? You know, on your creative strategy, like I'm sure there's more efficiency to be found if you start you know incorporating that yeah. copywriting stuff and making these things more convincing. Because what's probably the first thing that people Google about Bloom Super Greens? Probably does Bloom Super Greens work? Yeah. And so what is the question, like what is this desired outcome of your product? I don't know if it's like a healthier gut or just like better immune system, whatever it is, better sleep. There's a million different things. Like instead of saying, you know, this will help you digest better, just be like, I haven't had bloating in three weeks. Yeah. You know, Ar Armra Colostrum does this quite a bit in their ads. But so that's, you know, modern social proof. It's it's not necessarily that you're saying used by X amount of people. It's more so saying, I understand your concerns with our product. Here's what they, you know, here's what we do to solve those problems. Like take that Reddit search and inject it into your copy in a way that is very believable. A brand that does that really well is Hostage Tape. So they'll right. actually take a lot of Reddit, um, just a lot of posts from Reddit and turn them into ads, landing pages, and emails. Mm -hmm. um, so they did one about like how somebody fixed their snoring with mouth tape, yeah. and it wasn't even about hostage tape, but then they took that and they turned it into ad creative, they turned it into a landing page, yeah. turned it into an entire experience slash funnel. Right, which yeah. Which is pretty I just think generally cool. stories stories as ads is, is beginning to take a lot of shape. Athletic Greens, you know, uh, Harry Dry went on David Perel the other day and, and they were talking about all their favorite copywriting examples and yeah. Athletic Greens is one of them. Yeah. And they had a ad that said, uh, you're gonna need a smaller cabinet, which was super it's clever. Phenomenal ad, it's yeah. phenomenal because it's saying like, we're gonna consolidate all of your vitamins and all your pills, whatever, into this one thing. So really smart, allow someone to visualize what it's gonna do. Um, here's another super simple way to drive more conversions on your ads. And this one is not used by a ton of people. So it's called price anchoring. Have you heard of price anchoring before? So we just did this for several different brands. And I hope that this workshop will help our listeners understand like how to really execute this. Because when you put the price of a product against the price of something else that's commonly understood, then it's really easy for people to frame it and understand yeah. like, oh, this is a no brainer. Because that's what you're ultimately trying to do is get people to see an ad see your product, understand what it does and think this is a no brainer. I need to buy this. So we just did it for C4 and we compared the price of a, of a can of a singular can to a pack of gum. And so this thing converted like crazy because all of a sudden people are seeing it. They're like, Oh, like it's just the same as like picking up a piece of gum. I don't even think about that. Yeah. yeah I'll get a price C4 or I'll get a, I'll get a can of C4. The thing is obviously the cans are coming in a 12 pack. So this is a $24 purchase for somebody, but cost of a pack of gum, like our cans are literally the price of a piece of gum. Like it allows people to think, oh, this is like a no brainer. It's like when people will show a supplement and then it's like uh, 50 cents per scoop. Exactly. Right. right. And they use that price anchoring to, to help you realize, okay, sure it's $40, but when you really break it down, it's going to last me 45 days and it's 50 cents every single day. Yep. I could... I understand like that is easy to comprehend. And then now it feels like a good investment versus do I need to spend $45? Yeah. And and for whatever reason, the example that just came to my mind there would be like if carnivore snacks wanted to do this, like, yeah. you know, their bag versus a rib, an actual ribeye, like a quality ribeye, they're, they're a meat snack. And so, you know, this or you like meat snacks, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess I like, I like meat snacks. I like meat snacks for sure. Um, but so, the whole point of price anchoring is you want the customer to think I'd be dumb to not take advantage of this. Yeah. And there's a couple of other niches that we've been producing content for that this has worked super, super well. One of them is a teeth whitening example. So for whitening strips, 
uh, we price anchored against Zoom teeth whitening as a process that you get done at the dentist. And so that's around $500. And the way that you introduce this into your ads is say, I was talking to someone at the dentist and they mentioned that you don't actually need to get the Zoom teeth whitening for $500. You can just use these. Boom, whitening strip. And then you kind of like, now that you have someone's attention, it's how do you inject that social proof again? How do you address the questions that they're going to have? They're going to ask, how long does it take to see results? So your copy should reflect that and say, I started, my teeth started getting whiter in like, whiter in like six days. Like that, it, this, this goes into the script. Does it cause sensitivity? It even doesn't make my teeth sensitive like other whitening strips because they don't use uh, this uh, ingredient. They use this. Like you're selling without, you know, pushing without, uh, you're, you're just creating a two way conversation with the person's brain that's watching your video. So it, 100%, it's basically like, cause a lot of ads will do it's almost like bullet point. Yeah. It makes it different where it's like, uh, doesn't bullet use point this. Features. Incre- yeah. Doesn't in- <clears throat> have this ingredient. So therefore it doesn't have the sensitivity 100%. or like it doesn't create the, the, uh, mouth sensitivity or gum sensitivity. Yeah. Whereas if you phrase it, like you're saying in a completely different way where it's like, X, Y, Z, and yeah, it didn't even make my teeth sensitive. It just feels like a natural part of the script, a natural part of the video. 100%. And part of the, like the full story versus trying to like highlight the thing. Yeah, and, and this works great for prevention of future bad outcomes. So the other one that we did is uh, stop holes in your teeth from forming. And the way you kind of do that one is like, there's a study out there that says certain ingredients in big toothpaste may lead to holes in your teeth. So we say, as you know, this is the, like, you kind of flash the study first. Like, are you at risk of getting holes in your teeth? And you know, people can question the ethics of that. I don't know. (laughs) But, um, what you're, what you're pitching to the customer is saying, look, you could buy this product now, or you could face a much more expensive consequence down the road. And that is a super powerful way to get more people to buy because ultimately they feel this pain of three things in this scenario. Number one, I don't want to go to the dentist at all. Number two, I don't want to have the pain of having holes in my teeth. And number three, I don't want to spend whatever it is on this procedure to get them fixed. Why wouldn't I just buy this right now yeah. and get this problem never to occur? I'm, I'm with you on there. Um, I think for context, you should give like let people know how much you guys spend on ads like this isn't you're not just uh yeah so you know what i'm mean, saying like this isn't just some random for, for shit context i'm referencing our top performers out of the last like yeah. 460 ads we made in july um spent a lot of money lot. behind them so i mean we spent around over a million dollars and what's your agency's name oh, uh it's called nibble <laughs> yeah tasty little nibbles whatever you want to call it um but uh no i mean you know obviously like I want people to learn from those things. Like w- sure. those those formats are working now. And it's why you see so many organic videos doing well as ads, because once you're hooking someone's attention, like all of the platforms are trying to hide that sponsored tab yeah. as much as possible. So don't make it so fucking obvious that your ad is an ad <laughs> when the, the platform's what trying to hide that it's sponsored. Yeah. And so your job should be, I'm gonna hide too. Like I want this to look as organic as possible. Um, and those people, mediums are just continuing to perform way people better. People would always be like, oh, the best ads don't feel like ads. And the better line is the best ads feel like content. Yes. Right. That, you know, and it, to be honest, that was Elon who said that. Mm. Um, cause he was talking about how they, they were finally going to start running at some ads and like testing them. Yeah. Ironically, they only spent $150,000 on ads, which is crazy. Like before he so, cut it uh, or. No, just like in the whole in a whole quarter a year whatever they only spent one hundred fifty thousand. Mm. Um, but anyways, his whole thing was like, if we're gonna make ads, like we just have to make what feels like content. We're not yeah. gonna be making the typical ads. Yeah, a hundred percent. And then, so I wanted to go over one more ad that we didn't produce, but I know is converting like crazy. And again, the the whole point of this segment was how do you make your ads more convincing? So you have to convince people that they would be dumb not to take advantage of this thing. And so this ad, the headline, you know, I want people to steal this ad that converts like crazy. Here's the headline, how rich people avoid baggage claim. You got my attention. Are you talking about PJs? Are you talking, what are you talking about? The visual related to it 
is this piece of luggage trickling down the chute and then it crashes into another piece of luggage. Boom, you are so relatable at that point. Everyone watching the video is like, I have felt this experience. It sucks. Yeah. Like there's no one that hasn't had a bad back. Like no one that's flown recently has not had a bad experience with baggage claim and just 100%. You're at the end of a flight. You're already agitated. So you're, you're triggering this emotion. And then the, the curiosity comes from, well, how do rich people avoid baggage claim? Like, is there something that they know that I don't? Yeah. Uh, the next sequence is a product demo of this piece of luggage that collapses it's got a bunch of different compartments that extends at first and then collapses down and so it's a carry-on and everyone wants to be rich so they've built the curiosity of what do the rich people do now that they have your attention they demonstrate the dream outcome which is all of your stuff that would fit in a checked bag fitting into a carry-on and they visually demonstrate it and third it pitches this ideal life where you don't have to go to baggage claim you can just buy this product and have those worries forever solved. So great ad. I think people could definitely like what, learn. What from, brand is that one? Uh, it's called Soul Guard. S O L G A R D. I haven't seen it. I don't think it's like a. You know, I think they're just something that people need to understand. If you exist in a saturated market, then you have to outmarket your competitors. Yeah. That that is simply put. And a lot of people see a saturated market and they're scared of it. The actuality is you should see a saturated market and get excited because if you outcompete people, which most people are not very good at marketing, then you'll win. That's what we talked about in one of the last episodes where it was like, if you can't win the awareness game, you got to win like the trust game. And in this case, yeah. it's like, you just got to win kind of being the creative game. Yeah. Like just, if you're going against the big guys, chances are they're, they're acting in such a traditional way where it should be easy for you to beat them. Yeah. hundred percent. But that's all I got. I think, you know, there's some, there's some stuff in there. Like if you're struggling with your ad creative, like try and inject some of these different things into your script writing, into your video ads and see if it works. Let us know. So this brand generated 600K in new revenue using the CRO tool. So this is not news, but it's essential to know how customers navigate your website. So this time last year, Essential Essence learned this firsthand because they wanted two things. They wanted analytics on customer behavior and data on the most effective landing pages. So back to that CRO tool, they signed up for Heatmap. They increased their revenue per session by 24%, adding over 600,000 in annual revenue. And the best part is two parts. The first one, it takes five minutes to set up. And within minutes, you could have heat maps scanning your websites to be able to understand the analytics behind those customer behaviors and understand the data that's most effective to creating a landing page that converts. The second best part is you can get a free trial, try it for seven days. And if it's not helping you, if you're not blown away by the results that you're going to get from this, just cancel it. No questions asked. And you're not going to get charged a dime. But even within those first seven days, you're going to be able to find something that increases your conversion rate, which will increase revenue. So take it for a spin, try it for seven days and tell them Sweat Equity sent you. So I got a good amount. I'm not even gonna lie. Like it's a, it's a heavy piece because it's a Let's lot about product launches. Um, so for context, we went to the CrossFit games and I was going to go regardless, but it changed with, we were helping tier launch a shoe at the CrossFit games. And so I'm going to give you a little background on the shoe and then what we did. And then just product launch framework that I've talked about in the past, but I talked about one specific brand. Um, so I'm going to go a little more deep into that product launch framework, the same thing I used for this launch. Um, so, you know, tier, I, yeah. we've talked about tier. So last they were year they, all over the Olympics with the swimming stuff. Yeah. So they started as a swimming brand. Mm -hmm. um, this I was there with Corey, who's one of the directors and the Matt, the the CEO, and they absolutely crushed the, yeah, the Olympics. Katie Ledecky, like just dripped out in, in tier. Um, and she's, <laughs> is that a pun? No, but it was good. Yeah, it was good. It was solid. So I appreciate you, uh, bringing it up. It's important to acknowledge. Um, and uh, so at the CrossFit Games, last year, their shoe almost got banned mm. because Noble was the competitor before they absolutely died out. Right. And, or sorry, the, the title sponsor. <laughs> before they sponsor. died out, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> before they, they were the title sponsor. And Tier, he's he's pushing y'all. Well. Pushing. And uh, because of that, right, Noble's colors are kind of neutral-ish, some of them. And then Tier came up with like very bright yellow shoes. And it was like, it stole the spotlight on the competition floor. Yeah. And Tier had 40 plus athletes out of like the 90, 100 plus athletes. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of dominated the floor. And so Noble kind of complained about it to CrossFit. CrossFit almost banned the shoe. But then they were like, they talked to Tier and like, hey, next year you have to do a neutral color. And Tier was like, okay, we'll do a neutral color. But, and they didn't obviously don't tell CrossFit this, but they do a gray 
where when it flashes and light hits it, it uses a 3M material and it's reflective. Mm. So if I had this, I should have brought the shoe with me to show it. But if like I put it towards this light, it's like, dude, it's like a flash of light. That's cool. Right. And it was super cool. And again, 47 of the athletes at the games wore it. So we had a week. Everyone's just fucking blind over there. Dude, everybody just <laughs> pop, pop, pop. No, it was super cool because they had one event where it was called Friday Night Lights and they ran at like a, a I think a yeah. college track. And at night, the it's when they were running, dude, like the, the light would reflect off the shoe and it was like these flashes of silver uh, yeah. and white. It was cool. Anyways, so we put together in like 12, 10, 12 days, an entire launch for, for, the, uh, for the shoe. But what you had to do and what we had to pay attention to was like, it started with understanding what the narrative is. Like, what are we trying to tell? The whole narrative is around the shoe being reflective, right? So we had to make sure that every growth pillar, email, ads, SMS, organic content, landing pages, fueled that narrative. When we use athletes and influencers, did it, again, fuel that narrative, right? And so we put together this entire campaign, but the framework that we used was what I've talked about in the past. Tease, hype, collect, push and pull. Right. And so what I want to do is I'm going to go through that entire framework with uh, a lot of examples. And some of them I've talked about in the past. I'm going to go a little deeper and, and add other examples and then tell you how I also did it for tier. And I'll actually start with tier. So the first thing that we did was they have a, a large roster of athletes. Right. And so like 10 days out before the games, a lot of the athletes, we had like three, four different content series or ideas, sorry, that they were going through that were teasing the product. The first thing that we did was we had all the athletes film them doing a specific exercise, but the shoes were blurred. But when they would do the specific exercise, there was like flashes of light on their feet. And it was supposed to be kind of like a, something that you don't see typically, unless it is something sexual, like you don't see that normally on like Instagram. Blurred out. Yeah. yeah, blurred out. And so you have all of these athletes performing snatch, running on a track, climbing ropes, and like the shoes are blurred. And then again, flashes of light. That was kind of the first Thing. And then there was just a date at the end of, of the yeah. video. So all these were like micro stories, right? Then the next layer of content that we did was um, a piece of content where like, if if I was the videographer for an athlete, I was walking up POV to the athlete, giving them a box. And when they opened the box, it was just like light. And then, you know, they had to shut it. And then again, revealing the, the date that it was coming. So like it, we basically progressed the story of, okay, these are gonna be bright shoes. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last one was, I think something, yeah, it was something like where the athletes, uh, they were, what, whether it was like in their house or something like, yeah, yeah, check this out. And they just hit the lights and then it flashes hmm. because the same thing happened where I was uh, doing laundry, like really late at night, one of the days in the shoe, I had like one of the first shoes, it was in my office. And when I turned on the laundry room light, it like flashed in the light. And it was super cool. And I was like, okay, there's something here of like, we can nail it. So that's how we teased the product. And so up to that, we got, I think it was up close to a million views, like around just the the portion of teasing the product. Other brands and, and like why you even want to tease the product and, and kind of start creating pre-hype is you're really trying to create the curiosity gap. All that content that we created was to create a curiosity gap. And if for people that don't know what that is, is a difference between what someone knows and what they want to know. By when they see our content, when they see the content that was going on on Tears channel, you automatically want to be like, why is it blurred? Like, yeah. why is it flashing light? Why is it bright? Like, yeah. And you're and we're not giving them enough information where they could figure it out. We're leaving it up to the imagination. And you're also like making them enter a rabbit hole of Big sorts. Time. Like they're gonna search like tear blurred shoe and like one hundred percent tear like so one hundred percent. And so it creates this feeling of needing to know. And if you can create that feeling of needing to know then the people are going to stick around for the remainder of the story until launch day so that they can find out, right? Like that is human in nature of, and if you do it over and over again, it just amplifies that story. Um, and so one of the, uh, and actually I'll, I'll bring up one other example. So I told you we work with Blender's Eyewear and they started doing this a little bit with uh, Deion Sanders as well, mm. where they did two parts. They started teasing like their new product that they're launching with Dion for the upcoming season. But then recently, I don't know if you saw, they signed an NIL deal and they signed with, with Dion or no, they signed it with, do you remember Peggy? She's like the 99 year old grandma that was like, give me my theme music. Oh yeah. yeah they yeah. signed her to an NIL deal. And it was the first like fan NIL deal. 
And the same thing happens. Like they started leaking the contract. They started leaking like yeah. little bits and pieces to start teasing it up <laughs> to get people to understand like why, you know, what are they doing? Like, what are they up to? So this whole idea is you're teasing because you want to create anticipation. You want right. people to be in like indulged into the story. One of my favorite examples, and I already talked about this, so I won't go like into it too much was pure sport. And we talked about this brand in the past, but when they were launching their electrolyte drink, they did a really good job of teasing the product. They did uh, four things. So the first one was the cap in the caption, they played hangman. So every day they revealed another letter to like, Mm -hmm. get you to try to guess and name the product. And so they gamified it by every day. There was hundreds of people guessing to see what the product was. The next thing was they used micro stories to support the caption and, and, and again, further create that curiosity gap. So you play hangman and then like the, the video would be like a very close up, for example, of your chest or of your back or something like that. And it's just like sweat dropping down, mm -hmm. like very slow. Right. And it's again, playing into this idea that okay, we're playing hangman, we're releasing a product and here's like the visual that gives you another hint. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that was the whole thing The the visuals every single day got like, or the hints every single day got like a little more and a little more and a little more. And then the video ends every single time with like the lot, the day that it's going live. So for four days, you're just guessing, like you're trying to figure out like, what is that next clue that you're gonna give me mm -hmm. um, so that I can figure this out. Another brand that did a great job with this was Satisfy Running. So they launched this backpack with this brand called Osprey. I think mm. that's how you pronounce it, but this backpack brand called Osprey, right? And so what they first did was they got all of, and I'll, I should send you the photo so you could see, but- I, I got it. Okay, go to Satisfy Running, and then you're gonna find a post where uh, you're just gonna be a, see like a bunch of sticks in a valley or like almost like tripods in a valley. And Sounds they just like have my like- origin story. <laughs> and they just have like white, uh, rectangles on those sticks because they were blocking out the backpacks mm. and so what they did was it, it what i thought was super cool was they were announcing the partnership and they were announcing that they were doing a backpack but they didn't show what the backpacks looked like underneath each one of the sticks or like each one of the posts is a better way of doing it it just had color codes damn they got the crocs collab too yeah dude these guys are going crazy so did you see do you see the one that i'm talking about no they've got it this is a dope Super dope, dope brand. Page, yeah. yeah, they're crushing it. They, they, ha I mean, this brand is like such a classic and we'll, we'll have Cade, you know, obviously like throw this up on the screen, but if you scroll their grid, like goodness sick, gracious, dude. could it be more clear who they're for? You yeah. know, like they, they exactly have their target audience. And, They've nailed like using art direction to create like an identity that. And they're also just making trail running cool. Yeah. Like it's unbelievable how when you match a moment with your brand's you know aesthetic yeah like trail running was just simply not that cool like 10 years ago and now that it's sick and you also have these high production assets going on their instagram like yeah everything just kind of blends together to create a perfect market yeah moment. i couldn't agree more so opening it you see how like it's like like all these posts and then it's all the different backpacks but they're all covered by a rectangle right and then it's like a satisfy osprey adventure drop in later this week sign up to our newsletter for early access to drop uh, to the drop via link in the bio. Mm -hmm. This is them teasing the product and they do a really good job of getting people to comment. Like I, they urge for the bag They, you guys, my wallet can't take this, right? Like this is real hype and anticipation just being developed because of a one piece of social content. Yeah. Um, they did it as well with Oakley. So if you scroll up a little bit, you'll see a collab with Oakley where it just shows the back of a guy's head and they like, buzz cut the oakley logo into his head to announce that they're doing a collab with because i mean that person's a as this is a terrifying terrible haircut it just looks like a demon i mean <laughs> yeah, this looks like one of the bad guys in the matrix this would be but in they live uh, in the human world resident evil type shit for sure no you know? i've popped so many of these in the arcade before <laughs> yeah. um and so they did this as well with oakley where they took somebody they they had a performance sunglasses i was coming out and they like <laughs> buzz cut the oakley logo into somebody's head and it was just to announce that there's a sick collab coming and another i'll go through a few more examples but like because i'm going from like complex very complex to very like much more simple mm -hmm. bandit running they did another one where they're like releasing a collection in spring 2024 and they put somebody you know how like when you you take a shower and like the the glass doors they get foggy right well i'm i'm more of a cold shower guy because i'm built up that's cap and so you know if you're behind it and it's and it's hot it's humid like the the 
the shower gets like condens condensation gets on it. It gets yeah. blurry. They basically got behind a glass door like that and they put their hand on the, the glass and you could kind of see like the colors from the collection, but you can't see the collection. Mm. Right. And so again, it's them just creating, teasing the, the launch minted New York's another good, good one. Adidas did this as well, but I, now I want to give you, okay, well, what are some rules around teasing a product and, and before you start hyping it up and really it's dependent on how engaged your audience is. Yeah. Anything under 3% where you're like, your audience is not very engaged and you're trying to like build it back up. I'm teasing that, like I'm teasing the launch three times, a minimal. And that's not on my page. That's not including influencers and athletes and, you know, uh, celebrities, whatever. At that point, you're scaling like you're past 10. Like you are scaling the life out of, of mm -hmm. uh, that. If you do have very strong engagement, like a, a satisfied running, one or two times is fine. Uh, but personally, I like to tease a lot. Like I like to create as much anticipation around something as possible. Yeah. The next pillar is hyping up something, right? And the whole idea for this is good hype creates demand because then it creates a desire. It's that same desire that creates a feeling of needing something like that customer just needs this product. And the, and the way that you do this really is through storytelling right? Teasing is, is one layer. It's like just creating that curiosity. Yeah. But to create demand, you have to tell some kind of story. You know, what we did with tier, we had a hero campaign that we shot, dude. Like, so the CrossFit game started on Thursday. We shot this on Tuesday. Like I'm talking about a full blown production, third, like very expensive production. Mm -hmm. And we had to shoot a hero video. Then it was like 12, I think 12 micro videos, like micro stories. Yeah. And it all had to be edited within 12 hours. It was actually wild because I was watching. They were shooting in real time, dropping the footage while the shoot was still going on. There was somebody there editing the entire thing. It was pretty it was honestly pretty incredible mm -hmm. that it was all pulled off. Um, but the whole thing was on our end, we wanted to hype up the product because we wanted to piggyback off the hype for the CrossFit Games. Right. They have a lot. They have the uh, the ex person that won the CrossFit Games last year, they like they they basically had the top ten of male and nearly female as well, but mostly yeah. male mm -hmm. um, in their roster, right? So we were going to piggyback off of that hype to create hype for the shoe, and so we dropped the hero campaign and then supplementary hero ca campaigns following that, similar to AE one, where like they created it for social. There's actually not a Adidas AE one TV commercial or um, really, yeah, YouTube like two minute ad. That's right. Like it was all made yeah. for social. It's all these micro clips that they made for social. Like everything was made to be native to the platform, which I thought was super, super interesting. Yeah. And it's crushing. I mean, it's working for sure. And um, it's just like, why would you do anything else? Yeah. Like it's just completely eaten everyone's attention span. Yeah. And so going back to pure and, and this was, you know, I was talking about there like a pillar of entertainment. Pure Sport did this that same launch where they focused on education to hype up the product. So after they announced the product, they hyped up the product 10 times before the launch. Yeah. Right. But it all stemmed on product education and they were focusing on, OK, like if so, why is you have to always reverse engineer, like, why would somebody buy this product? And then what is like the outcome? Right. What is the jobs to be done that I'm going to buy this product because you're going to help me get this job done? Mm -hmm. That is what you're you're trying to reverse engineer. And so they followed the same framework that I was talking about with. Um, with uh, AE1 where, okay, so what is the benefit of the supplement that they were dropping? It was hydration. What was the outcome? It was better performance. What is the story? Improving endurance performance. They didn't really use characters, but they used multiple characters in many ways. They didn't have an Anthony Edwards. They used all their athletes. Um, the product is then electrolytes, the type of values, education, right? So my whole thing here is when you're hyping up a product, you have to run it through this framework of what is the benefit? What is the outcome because of that benefit? Then how are you going to weave that into a story? Who are the characters you're then going to use? How are you going to announce the product or what is the product? How are you then going to, or what type of value are you going to communicate to get this across successfully? And when you put that all together, that's how you're then able to create pieces of content, then hype up um, the product. That is part two of the framework. Part three of the framework is, is something more simpler. It's collecting right? The goal is to collect people on a wait list or an early access list or um, some form of data where you can you can hit people early. You could start collecting it on our end, for example, for tier. Um, we just we made a wait list. They had never used a wait list in, in the past. Or I think they've done it once, but they did do it like too successful. 
And so we were going to release the product early before the before we released it at the games, right? And so everything, the reason we were putting, um, the reason we were putting the date on the on all the posts and having all the athletes posted, et cetera, was we were just trying to feed that wait list. Yeah. The other thing that we had that we did that was interesting is like most of the time people will take it something that they put on their feed and they'll just share it to their story. We were having all the athletes post it natively to their stories. Because anytime you share something, for, I don't know if you've noticed this, but like sh you share something from your feed to your story, it performs significantly worse. But if you post it natively, it's all it gets seen as like its own piece of content, mm. right? And it performs tenfold better, right? And and so the whole the whole goal was to get people onto this wait list so we could already start hyping up the product in more detail via email. So as soon as they joined, they started going through an entire email sequence about the product, the story behind the products, why we're doing what we're doing, et cetera, to push to, again, create more of that anticipation and more of that hype around it before launch day. Yeah. And so we had a significant <clears throat> amount of people. I can't give like actual numbers, but like a significant amount of people that joined the wait list where it, you know, it was going to perform really well. So yeah. I'm going to give some ideas around here that I, I think are interesting. So the one, for example, with Pure Sport or with others, it's like, Things that you can leverage to collect and, and build up the, the wait list is one is limited quantity. Like if, if you do have limited quantity and you want to uh, give it to people that take action before others, this is a very good way of building it. UVU, it's a, a British streetwear brand that I I buy. They you should always, move to London. I should. Or Manchester. You're more of a Manchester no, I cat. do. I need the sun. They don't fucking see the sun. No, not at all. Cool. You know, and that, that ain't me. But yeah. Um, they're more stylish than us too. I'll, I'll uh, say that. Everything in my closet is unfortunately British. Exactly. Um, so limited quantity is one of them. Like if, if you if you do have limited quantity, give it to select people first that take early action. Early access is another one, launching early, et cetera. The one that I thought was really interesting because I went down the funnel was, did you see how Represent built, it, built up their wait list for the Dexter collab? No, I didn't. Okay. So it was pretty cool because I, I, usually most brands don't do this. Brand, most... Most of the time it's creators that use this tactic, but they did a whole mini chat funnel, mm. right? So anytime they were promoting the Dexter collab, they caught, it was like comment lookbook or something. I don't remember the exact word, but yeah. it was like, imagine it was like comment lookbook. And then there'd be the automated DMs of, Hey, like here's a sneak peek of the lookbook, hit this to be, to be able to get notified. Then they get your email, but then they would send you to the exact lookbook and they're showing you everything that's going to be dropped before it was ever dropped. And it was like, hey, well, do you want early access to this? You click yes. All of a sudden now you're part of that sequence where they were leveraging the DMs as like their wait list. And yeah, so they had a large, drive. yeah, they had a <laughs> large uh, buildup of instead of building up the email list, they had a large group of people that were in the DMs that now they can hit when the product drop, mm -hmm. which I thought was really interesting because you don't see many brands use that for for many chat or they don't use many chat for for themselves um other ideas too i think you could use lower to higher pricing as something to get somebody on the wait list if hey the first 50 people are going to get this price the next 50 at this one this one etc you could gamify the pricing you could do an asc ascending pricing ladder there's a lot of I, well, a lot of ways you, to you think about someone here. like tier you know they have that super unique product with the shine and this is also something you could obviously do with colorways. Um, but engineering scarcity into it, like there's got to be a reason to jump on the early access list. Like 100%. Ame Leon Adore, I've talked about them a lot. They just dropped some crocodile skin loafers. Um, and these up. Uh, like it's the type of thing where you understand that their shoes are probably going to sell out tomorrow when they drop it to everybody when they, when they drop it tomorrow to their email list and in store like it like every major size will be gone by like sunday you gonna buy these huh are you gonna buy these i already copped them <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, bare, you're, you're you're getting ahead of yourself and so what they do is they they sent uh snake and crocodiles not yeah. the not the snake colored ones the the black ones but yeah. anyways um they send an early access email to all of their collections. Kith does the same thing. Like yeah. all these major streetwear brands send early access to their email list and SMS. And it couldn't be more effective because think about it. You're sending this to the people most interested in what you're about to do. You're sending this to people who they're going to be most hurt if they don't get the product on the initial drop. And so those two things kind of combine to drive a lot of conversion. Obviously, I'm going to take advantage of this drop if I really want it. 
and I think, okay, maybe I'm going to have to get this second hand on StockX or GOAT or something like that. Like, yeah, yeah. fuck no. Like I'm, I'm buying it at the early access. So I don't 100%. even have to deal with that stuff. And especially, you know, when you layer in all the things that you just mentioned, which is the promotion, which is building the hype, building the list, like acquiring all these people who are telling you they're interested, whether it's engaging on social or giving you their information. Yes. You want to send them that early access, you know, conversion focus email say, Hey, thank you for your support. This is live a day early. We're probably going to sell out tomorrow. I would act now if you actually want it. Like 100%. so much better than, you know, remarketing. I, I don't, just all the different things that have kind of become the digital marketing infrastructure these days. Um, so it's really smart, but if they limited colorways, you know, like there was one color that was really, really, really getting a lot of interest, then maybe you only want to make 200 of those. Yeah. 100%. And similarly, maybe the shiny shoe, like maybe you only want to make like 500 of those. Yeah. Because then so it's a status symbol. The next and final layer to this is pushing and pulling. And the whole thing is people think that launch day is the only day you could promote your product. And it's actually the, the opposite of as soon as you launch, it's like you need to be pushing your product. But you don't want to solely for the next seven days only like promote, promote, promote. Yeah. You want to do this organically where you're promoting the brand, you're promoting uh, the story around the brand and then interjecting the product into it. And so a lot of why we shot the hero campaign and then we created the micro stories around all those athletes were throughout the remainder of the CrossFit games, we were going to drip that the entire time, mm -hmm. right? And so we were able to, you know, Saturday, obviously it was uh, from Friday to to Sunday, we were dripping the, the remainder of the campaign and, and that was like our pulling. And then in between that, we would then have uh, videos that were going out where we were actually pushing the product. The thing was we had to be very sensitive to what happened. So a lot of like what we put into the playbook and put into the strategy, like we had to nix. Right. And it was like, obviously, cause one of the players uh, passed or died and um, he was a tier athlete. Oh shit. Yeah. He was a tier athlete. He was in the campaign. I met him the day before it happened. Like it was, he was the first, and he was not, he was also the first athlete tier ever signed. So like, it was going to look really bad for us if like we act like nothing happened. We're just promoting the campaign because we have to, you know, hit numbers. And so we had to navigate the waters very differently. So, you know, it's we an had, interesting dude, dynamic was, to say the least. Yeah. So, you know, we, we had a creator that was going to be at the games every day doing different like on the street interviews. And we had different like one day we were going to be doing like a quiz yeah. kind of thing, trivia, challenges, just all that. Lighthearted fun. And yeah. we had to nix all of it, right? And that was going to go into us kind of creating like this pulling content. Like it's fun. It's about the games. Like if I come up to you and you're wearing a t-shirt and I'm like this or that, and I, I show you like one of the collections of the shoes, or if you do trivia around just CrossFit Games athletes, like who was the, the person that came in third in 2017? Yeah. And we give you a free pair of shoes for that. Like all those things would have performed really well because we were treating the games like live social, right? Like how are we just amplifying and creating a ton of content throughout there? But we had to obviously nix it because yeah, of that. So what we had to do and kind of switch, we had to take the strategy and like change it on the fly. And so what we did was for our live social, we, um, any athlete who won a heat, who won an event, who like hit a PR or whatever, we were shooting content. And then we, one of the guys snuck his laptop into the games and they were just, we were just edit, pumping edit, out edit. Yeah. content throughout the, throughout the thing. And then one of the things that was kind of hot during the Olympics was a lot of brands were like taking their athletes and creating like Nike esque ads where, um, you know, like their athlete gets first and they kind of like do a banner photo and like put like very small text over it. Mm -hmm. Tears, uh, one of the cool ones, I'll send it to you. One of the athletes, um, his name is, name is Ricky Garrard. He, they did a mild test and dude, he absolutely smoked everybody hmm. i'm talking about he ran a 454 i think it was and the other people were running like 530s 540s yeah and so tears slogan is always in front and uh i just texted you this image so a lot of it was like we were shooting live social and then putting that banner on it that said always in front anytime they were beating some of their competition um but again like when we look at the ae campaign and we're talking about pushing and pulling um most of their content is pulling. It's like these brand pieces that naturally push 
the product. And so mm -hmm. when you're thinking about you've created all that, you've teased it, you've hyped it, you got people on the wait list, you just don't want to like promote, 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 and like make sure that they're seeing the product and you're trying to sell the product. You want to naturally push it throughout your content that's more branded content. The other thing that we had to do was, um, so because of we had to like put back or like kind of chill on the content, right? We were like, okay, let's double email volume. Yeah. But we have to do it in a way where it's not promotional. So what we did was every day we sent an email that was a, and this was us like coming up with this at like 12 o'clock at night before doing it the next morning, right? Because we're like changing shit on the fly. And so one of the things we had to do was we would send out an email and it was like, like a recap email of the CrossFit games and all of our athletes and how they were do doing, mm. right? With all, but the product photography obviously had the entire collection in it. And so we used, cause there were six different products. And so like, if we used Ricky Garrard, we showed the running shoes, like the carbon fiber shoes. If somebody was just regular workout, they were in the CX, uh, in the, in the trainers. If somebody was deadlifting, they were in the barefoot ones. And so we were able to showcase the collection through this, uh, through essentially the, just like a recap of the games. Yeah. Right. And then anybody who clicked anything in that, we had retargeting sequences, et cetera. It's within, like built in lifestyle imagery. Yeah. Yeah. Within the email. So because this was a live event, some other things that we got to do on the pushing and pulling side was, so we created, um, baseball cards for all the CrossFit athletes that are in tiers roster. Mm. Right. And so we made, I think it was 47 different cards and we were handing out card packs. Right. And, and what was cool about it was it had a natural network effect. So we would hand it out and all of a sudden that entire row is looking to see what athletes they got. Uh, you know, this person wants Sharing this it. athlete, yeah. this person wants this one and giving one person cards. Now everybody sees the brand and then on the back end of every card, there was a QR code to the launch right. or right to the landing page. Um, and it was sick because we handed out and in one entire section, all of a sudden we're paying attention to that section. And the entire section, dude, is like looking at the cards That's dope. and like sharing them yeah. and everything. And then the other thing that we did was um, the Miami Heat, and they still do this, but the Miami Heat during the playoffs, they only they give all fans white, white shirts. shirts yeah. yeah. And it's what called white hot heat. And so what we did, we again, playing into this metallic, this silver, there's reflective. The cards were reflective and everything. They were like holographic. But then the other part we did was we had people handing out uh, shirts on in different sections. So we had 3000 shirts printed and they were black with re reflective lighter that said tier. And the goal was if we take over a section because the G CrossFit games was on TV, then the, uh, when they would pan to a certain section, that whole section would be like tier and reflective. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was just like earned media. It was like, how can we leverage the shirts to what, when somebody's watching on TV and there's hundreds of thousands of people watching, they see tier. And so like, that was another, kind of another thing we did there were some other things that we again we had to like nix because of the whole situation but right. this idea with with the launch is every pillar has to work in unison email sms landing pages guerrilla marketing organic paid yeah. it all has to work in unison it's not like paid's doing this landing page is doing this email's doing this it's like no, no 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 what is that overarching narrative i'm gonna always hammer that home and how does every pillar fuel that one narrative and so what i want you to walk away with this is is the the framework that you need to be using which again is tease the product make sure that you're creating anticipation around it and, and a lot of curiosity people have to be curious if you want them to buy into it that starts with what is what is that overarching narrative like you have to know that so that you can every piece of content feeds into that then you have to hype it up create a lot of of a lot of anticipation around it make sure that people are excited for it they're they're want to to buy the product and that starts with either being educational entertaining inspiring motivating etc using all of those kind of together to create that hype and demand for a product and then at some point you want to uh, build up the wait list you want to get people early access these are your deeper fans and you want to be able to even leverage them in some ways for ugc or, or for the exclusivity it becomes like what you were saying like it's it's a it becomes a status symbol if i could get something before you it's like, I'm going to share that. And then yeah, push like, how and pull. are you so plugged? Yeah. And then push and pull, like make sure that you're, you're continuing to promote like launch day is one day, continue to promote the product via ads, via organic, via email, SMS, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then make sure you're doing it in a way where it pulls people into the brand instead of just trying to push a product. So that's what I got. Uh, overall though, it was, it was a super successful launch. Um, it beat the, the forecast, which is always Right. And that was being short a day and a half. Right. Like we had a, like I said, like we had to cut it 
a lot of stuff out because it, was, it just didn't feel right. Yeah. Um, dude, the energy at the games was weird. Like, that was my first time ever going to the CrossFit Games. It was strange. Because like, night one was probably crazy dope. And then. No, the first event was <laughs> that happened on the first event. Damn. So like we, I, I think I, I don't know if we, we texted a little bit, but like we go to that event, right? And we're like at the finish line and we see the first people come in, yada, yada, that event finishes. And now teams are starting to get ready to go. And like this guy, Ian, who, who flew out there and was uh, filming like the Brand Builders episode, he's out there, we're starting to film and like teams are getting ready to go. And it was supposed to start at 8 a.m. And it's like 8, 15 p.m. And like nothing's happening. Then you start seeing people like searching in the bushes and stuff and, like still nobody knows what's going on yeah um then it's 8 20 8 25 and, and they just announced over the speaker that it was like hey the team's event has been canceled please exit the the area and everybody's like what, what? and like yeah. everybody like starts taking steps back and like still looking at the the area and you start seeing like people on paddle boards a rescue team like going out into the water and they're starting to like circling rumors of Somebody was like, I think a civil, like a, a spectator jumped in. Somebody said, I think somebody got bit by something. And then like the rumors just started escalating where then it was like, I think they're looking for an athlete. I think an athlete went missing. And so then I call somebody and I was like, Hey, like, I think an athlete went missing. I think something happened. Like, um, like, I don't know what's up. Like they just canceled the, the team event. And then Corey was like, yeah, they're looking for Lazar. And I was like, Oh wow. Like that's crazy that is crazy and then the uh yeah they 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 say that they're looking for lazar and then like it gets confirmed not through crossfit games but it gets confirmed by people that he went missing during the event and like nobody noticed and like right. I, i'm sure you saw like the twitter videos oh yeah he's like swimming he's you know he's doing the the thing and then he starts breaststroking and then he starts like bobbing head and up and down and like just disappears and nobody notices and his brother competed as well and like it was a really bad uh, situation yeah it was a whole thing but the crazy thing was like crossfit games didn't say anything until like 10 p.m that night um that they were like just continuing with the games and shit so like it it made it yeah it was a weird situation it was a weird situation but overall like i don't mean to sound like insensitive that the launch did go well like you know, what we were there to do um went well um um, well, shit, dude. Um, I know you have a meeting in 15 minutes. I have a meeting in 15 minutes. People think we fake being busy after every episode. People also think we flex. fake the podcast. They do think that. I'm not even talking to anybody right now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't no, know. I, I, I was like, damn, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, did people just don't really like look up anything. No, I, there was a <laughs> comment recently on, I think I told you it was your short, your YouTube short. I was talking to John about it. It was your YouTube show where you're talking about dupe and it in the comment just goes fake ad podcast. Yeah. And bro, I was just dying. Which is a like, crazy chirp. Cause it's like, it's coming through the brand account. And if all you do is click through, you will see that there are 42 episodes. Just give a, just give a tiny little bit yeah. of a fuck. Like, you know, <laughs> it, <laughs> you could have been 30 seconds into an episode instead of writing that comment. Yeah. But anyways, um, Yeah. Like, subscribe, support, please. And we're also seeing all of the comments. People, I mean, I'm sure you got blown up about it, but people loved the, you know, building public on their brands. Yeah. Um, still trying to figure out how to like balance that and do that as like one series um, versus like kind of this more exploratory teaching stuff, not teaching, but just sharing what we learned. So 100%. I, uh, I think we just do it once a month or something like that. Um, and start bringing on brands because i mean my instagram story had it was like two or three hundred people submit their brands like we could do that shit for the next yeah no i had like 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 15 yeah friends right just friends. homies you know <laughs> um all right we'll catch y'all next week